Pastor Louis is an absolute icon. But in case you don't know him, um, we're going to have a little bit of a chat to, so people can get to know who you are. Okay. So, Pastor Louis, are we, are we switched on, guys? Excellent. You're from the States, yes? Yes. Okay. Could you tell us a little bit about, about, little bit about your history? A um, little bit about where you grew up, um, what you did as a child, and, and how you came to what you're doing now. I was born in the island of Puerto Rico. At six, we moved to New York City. So I'm from a tiny island to a huge uh, place. Yeah, absolutely. And uh, grew up in New York City. Wow, that's, um, it's, it's quite interesting, isn't it, that you went from such a small town to a big town. Was, were there any sort of big lessons you learned in such a quick change like that? Uh, learn how to make zip guns, learn how yep. to fight in gangs, uh, learn how to steal, and uh, a lot of interesting things. Yeah, that's pretty cool. It's pretty cool. Hey, Dimmy, I can see you beaming over there. <laughs> now, um, Pastor Louis, we heard, well, I've heard... Um, that you've had an absolutely amazing past. You've been in the media quite a bit, haven't you? Yes. All right. Now, I hear you've been part of a, a band, a band that people may not remember the name, but you've had hits that we all know and that we have actually probably could sing about. All right. Are you okay, Sharon? Contain yourself there. You're absolutely gushing. <laughs> now, I believe you were once part of Bill Haley and the Comets. Is that correct? That's correct. That is correct. What was your, I hate to do this, but what was one of your biggest hits that everyone knows? Everyone knows uh, Rock Around the Clock. Rock Around the Clock. All right, so we're going to have a karaoke session later, right, with you, where you can lead us all together. In fact, that, we're going to sing that to close the service out later. You are, huh? Yeah, we, I think we'll do that. We'll make an exception. Now, while also here, you've actually starred in Australian television. Um, along Australian royalty on the Midday Show. Could you tell us a little bit about that? You know, I uh, came to Australia, and because Bill Haley is an um, internationally known name, uh, they wanted to interview me. So uh, one of the first shows was Carrie Ann Show, mm -hmm. um, and then the next one was the Midday Show, and then uh, I was on several radio stations and uh, the uh, Sydney Journal, is that what it is? Um, the Sydney uh, Herald. Herald. Uh, oh, the, the Sydney Morning Herald. Morning Herald. That, that is correct. So anyway, yes. I, there were several, several interviews, and I didn't realize how big Bill Haley was here uh, until I came over. It's pretty amazing, isn't it? Sometimes you're just you're not aware about how many people you can actually touch. Yeah, you know, it's yeah. interesting because at the same time that I was there with the, uh, the Kerry Ann show, they were interviewing another fella who was also from Puerto Rico. Oh, was that right? uh, he, he was a blind guy. And um, he did the, the song uh, Light My Fire. I don't know how many of you remember that, Light My Fire. And uh, um, so he was being interviewed before I was. Right. And I wanted to get to him because I wanted to witness about Christ. You right. know? <laughs> <laughs> uh, but his, his bodyguard was a big uh, mafioso sort yeah. of a guy, and he didn't let me get to, to, uh, to him. Wow, uh, But uh, it, it's just interesting how... Um, uh, how the Lord took me from all of that and trans transported me into this glorious life that, uh, that I wouldn't choose any other yeah, thing. Yeah, absolutely. And that, speaking about that, so I've here we've gone from this absolutely glamorous lifestyle of rock and roll, and now we've even got a more glamorous lifestyle of evangelism. Can you tell us a little bit about what you're doing these days? I do a lot of training. I've been training now for many years. Uh, and some of the people that you may know that I've trained, that's uh, David Ashwick. I baptized him and trained him in evangelism. Uh, John Brashaw um, and uh, Jeffrey Rosario. A lot of kids that have come over to preach at your at uh, GYCs and all that. Wow. So a lot of those young kids, I call them young kids, uh, were actually my students. So we were on a program called Mission College, from which started AFCO, Arise, and all that. Wow. All, all those schools started from our school. Wow. Um, Pastor Daniel was one of our students, and uh, his wife, Geraldine, was one of our students. So we have students everywhere. That's incredible. My sister actually attended the Arise program really recently with David Asherick. Um, it's, uh, it's good to see that you've really inspired some people there, and through your work with God, you're leading these incredible people out there, and they're really, really spreading the word of God with such conviction The Lord has power. really blessed. Mm -hmm. uh, we, we never intended that that's what would happen. We just wanted, had a burden to train people to become effective soul winners, lay people. And uh, we have people all over the world now Absolutely. who are preaching. So just and praise that's, God. that's the way it should be, isn't it? Mm -hmm. So, Pastor Louis, thank you so much for the You're time welcome. of Q&A. Now, 
I'd like you to, uh, to stay exactly where you are. It's now your time to, uh, to spread the word with us, and we look forward to your presentation you this here? afternoon. Okay, very good. Um, all right, I'll go as fast as I can. Uh, in in uh, the year 1912, Al Albania got its uh, freedom from Turkey, and they requested Prince Adin, a Turk, to uh, be their leader, but he wasn't sure he wanted to be the leader of these rebels. And so finally, um, after a while, uh, he showed up. And when he showed up, they celebrated. They celebrated for a week that Prince Adin had accepted the invitation to become the leader of Albania. Uh, then at the end of the week, a telegram came from the Sultan of Albania, uh, pardon me, of Turkey, uh, to Albania, telling them that uh, Prince Adin had just decided to become their prince. Well, that was kind of shocking to them because they had been celebrating for one week with Prince Adin. So they wondered <laughs> what was going on. They went to Prince Adin to ask him questions. He had disappeared. It turned out it wasn't Prince Adin at all. He was a guy named Otto Witt, a circus actor. He was actually passing near Albania. He heard that Prince Adin uh, had been asked and his bodyguard told him that uh, he looked like Prince Adin, so he showed up as Prince Adin. They accepted him as Prince Adin. They gave him a harem of 25, 50 uh, women, and they celebrated for a whole week, and then he disappeared. <laughs> and so, uh, the one who should have gotten the glory was Prince Adin, but the one who actually got the glory was Odo Huyen. So, I'm going to ask you a question. When you think of Pentecost, what comes to your mind? Quickly, I don't have a lot of time. What comes to your mind? Holy Spirit, what else? Upper room, what else? Come on, you university students. What else? 3,000, what else? Oh, tongues of fire coming on, on the head. Well, it sounds like, uh, let's see. Power, but who should you be thinking about? When it comes to Pentecost, most of you think of all of these things because you have been made subject to something called, what do you think it's called? The power of? Suggestion. Power of what? Suggestion. Let me illustrate. Raise your right hand. Would you raise your right hand with me? Now, I want you to do what I tell you to do. Do what? Do what? That? What I tell you to do, okay? With your right hand, I want you to rub your chin with me. Rub your chin with me. Your chin. Your chin. Why are you rubbing your cheek? That's called the power of suggestion. And so what's happened to you is that you have been, uh, if you pardon the expression, duped to think that Pentecost is uh, all about what you mentioned, but you did not mention the most important person that Pentecost is all about, and that is Jesus. Okay? What was the purpose of the Holy Spirit? What did Jesus say? When Jesus was still before his crucifixion, he said, But when the Comforter is come, whom I will send unto you from the Father, even the Spirit of truth which proceeded from the Father, he shall what? Testify of who? Of me. Who's me? Jesus. All right. Uh, so Jesus said, But ye shall receive power after that the Holy Ghost has come upon you, and ye shall be witnesses unto me. But none of you mention Jesus. All of you mention all the other things. Why? You said Jesus? Well, I'm, my, my humble apologies. I must be hard of hearing. All right. And so listen, folk. Listen. The whole purpose of Pentecost was to reveal who? Jesus. But most of us, all we hear is about tongues, 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 tongues. Is that true? But let's do a, a quick study of Acts chapter 2. First of all, first of all, I want you to know that 
when the Holy Ghost came upon them that day, all right, what was their posture? Were they kneeling? Were they standing? What were they doing? Huh? What was their posture when the Holy Ghost came upon them? They were what? Praying. How many of you say praying? Can I see your hands? How many of you don't want to raise your hand? Okay. The reality is, if you read verse 2 of chapter 2, it says where they were sitting. Where they were what? Sitting. sitting. The Holy Ghost came upon them while they were sitting, not kneeling. The reason is that God was not interested in the posture. He was interested in the condition of the heart. When those disciples got to the place where God could trust them with the power, it was not about their posture. It was about the condition of the heart. When he saw that change had taken place in their hearts, then he trusted them with the power. If Christ had trusted them with the power without the change of heart, they would have done what John and James had suggested just before they entered into Jerusalem. Shall we call fire down from heaven and burn them up? So, Acts chapter 2. Notice it says, they were all amazed. These people who came from all over the world and were there speaking different languages, heard them speak in the, their particular home language. They heard them hear Bojik Blagoslav. What is that? Who said that? What is that? Que Dios le bendiga. What is that? They heard in Spanish. They heard in different languages in Italian, right? And they probably heard something in Chinese as well. Anyway, what I'm saying is this. They heard them speaking the wonderful words of God in their own mother tongues. And they said, what does this what? What does this mean? They did not understand. They could not comprehend how these Galileans could speak in their mother tongues when they were only Galileans. So they said, how here we speak the wonderful words of God from these fellows who are Galileans? What does this mean? And so Peter then got up. And when Peter got up, he said to them, Ye men of Judea, and all ye that dwell at Jerusalem, be this known unto you, and hearken to my words. I'm going to give you an explanation, in other words. You want to know what's going on? You want to understand what's taking place? I'm going to give you an explanation. And then he began. He began with who? Notice what he's saying. Acts chapter 2 and verse 16. But this is that which was spoken by the prophet who? Joel. Peter is bringing their attention to prophecy. To what? When people out there see all the strange things that are taking place in the world, and they ask, what does this mean? You need to give them the answer from prophecy. From what? Prophecy. So Peter began to quote Joel chapter 2. He's saying, look, you want to understand what's taking place? This is a fulfillment of Joel chapter 2. And then he begins to quote verse 16, 17, 18. He quotes from the prophet Joel. Do you have your Bibles? If you have your Bibles, notice what it says. Okay. It shall come to pass in the last days, say of God, I will pour out my spirit upon all flesh. Your sons and your daughters shall prophesy. Your young men shall see visions. Your old men shall dream dreams. Now my servants and my handmaidens, I will pour out my spirit in those days. And they shall prophesy. And I will show them the wonders in heavens above and signs in the earth beneath, blood and fire, vapor and of smoke. Now as it says, the sun shall be turned into darkness and the moon into blood before that great notable day of the Lord. It shall come to pass that whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. So this is a fulfillment of the prophecy of Joel. I want you to notice that the Spirit of God did not let Peter to apply it to our day. He led Peter to apply Joel chapter 2 to when? To their day. To the time when they were hearing these strange things and wondered what does this mean. Now listen. Peter quoted prophecy, which means then that you should know prophecy well enough to quote it. Right? I don't hear a lot of amens. I hear some, some kind of shy amens. Right. 
But look, no, look, then he makes the application. I want you to notice what happens here. Ye men of Israel, hear these words. Jesus of Nazareth, a man approved of God among you by miracles and wonders and signs which God did by him in the midst of you as you yourselves also known. Him being delivered by the determined counsel and for knowledge of God, you have taken and by wicked hands have what? You have crucified him and slain. Whom God hath raised up, having loosed the pains of death, because it was not possible that he should be holden of it. Now, were there signs and wonders in the days of Christ? Yes or no? Of course, he performed many signs and wonders. Did he not? Did he resurrect the dead? Yes. Did he give sight to the blind? Yes. In fact, when John the Baptist sent a message to, uh, through the, his disciples to Jesus, are you he or do we wait for another one? What did he say? Go tell John that the lame walk, the blind see, the dumb uh, speak and hear. The dead are raised to life. Were there young people who had uh, visions in the days of Christ? How old was Mary? She was a young girl. Were there old people who had uh, visions? How old was Simeon, Anna, Zechariah? Did they have visions? Yes or no? Yes. Of course. Was there an earthquake? Yes. yes, at the cross there was an earthquake. Did the sun uh, not give his light? Yes. yes. At midday, the day went black. So, all of those things that happened in the days of Christ were predicted by the prophet who? Joel. So, you men of Galilee, or you men of Judea, and all of you guys that come from all over the world, Joel predicted that everything that happened in the days of Christ would happen, and they were fulfilled. Then he turns to another prophet. Notice the other prophet. For David did speak concerning him. Verse 25. I saw the Lord always before my face, for he is on my right hand, that I should not be moved. Therefore did my heart rejoice, and my tongue was glad. Moreover, also my flesh shall trust in hope, because thou wilt not leave my soul in hell, neither wilt thou suffer thine holy one to see corruption. Thou hast made known to me the ways of life. Thou shalt make me full of joy with thy countenance. Men and brethren, let me freely speak unto you of the patriarch David, that he is both dead and buried, and his sepulchre is with us until this day. So now, he makes another statement for prophecy, and now he's going to do the application. Notice what he says. Therefore, verse 30, being a prophet and knowing that God had sworn with an oath to him that of the fruit of his loins, according to the flesh, he would raise up Christ to sit on his throne. He, seeing this before, spake of the resurrection of Christ, that his soul was not left in hell, neither his flesh did see corruption. This Jesus hath God raised up, whereof we are all witnesses." Therefore, being by the right hand of God exalted and having received of the Father the promise of the Holy Ghost, he has shed forth this which you now see and hear. Isn't that amazing? So everything that happened to Christ had been predicted where? In the writings of Joel and the prophecies of David, which comes from the Psalms. Then he says, This Jesus have God raised up, whereof we are all witnesses. Now, have you noticed something interesting so far? Who is Acts chapter 2 speaking about? Who? Jesus. Who is he speaking about? Jesus. And the Spirit of God leading the apostle to make the application and the prophecy concerning Christ. Now, 
Therefore, being by the what? By the right hand of God. This Jesus have God raised up whereof we are all witnesses. Therefore, being by the right hand of God exalted and having received of the Father the promise of the Holy Ghost, he has shed forth this which you now see and hear. Then it continues. For David, pardon me, verse 33. Therefore, being by the right hand of God exalted and received of the Father, then it says, verse 34, For David has not ascended into the heavens, but he said himself, The Lord said unto my Lord, Sit thou on my right hand, until I make thy foes thy footstool. Therefore, let all the house of Israel know assuredly that God hath made that same Jesus, whom you have crucified, both Lord and Christ. You wanted to understand, know what this means? This is what it means. Jesus was truly who he claimed to be. He was the sent of God. It was predicted that he would be crucified, he was crucified. It was predicted that he would perform signs and wonders, he performed signs and wonders. It was predicted that young people and old people would see dreams and have visions, they saw dreams and visions. It was predicted that, they would, that the sun would uh, not give us light, it didn't give us light. There was an earthquake, there was an earthquake. It was predicted then that he would die, he would raise, raise again, and then that he would ascend and sit on the right hand of the majesty in heaven. And he has done that. So that's what you're hearing, and, and that's what you're seeing. The, the reality that the one that you crucified, who you condemn as a criminal, in reality, he is indeed the Son of God, and you're responsible for doing that wicked work against him. When they heard this, the Bible says they were pricked to the what? What's the next verse it says? It says, when they heard this, they were pricked in their heart and said unto Peter and to the rest of the apostles, men and brethren, what shall we what? What shall we do? Oh, no. In other words, you mean that we killed the, the Son of God? How can it be? What do we do now? These people felt terribly guilty, condemned. But God in mercy let them know that there was forgiveness for them. And Peter said unto them, verse 38, repent and what? And be baptized. Every one of you in the name of the Jesus Christ for the remission of sins, you shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. Now, let's look at some of the things. Notice it says then that Jesus has made both Lord and Christ. All right? Now, what does that mean? Jesus is enthroned. What does it mean? He is what? He is enthroned. He is on the right hand of the majesty, where? In heaven. That's good news, what do you say? How important was it to the disciples for them to realize that Jesus now was not the malefactor that they thought he was, but rather that now he was sitting where? At the right hand of the majesty in heaven. You guys are not getting too excited about this. When you know somebody is sitting at the right hand, what does that mean? Well, you know you have a friend. When you have a friend who is at the right hand of uh, power, what does that mean? It means you got, you're connected. You're what? You're connected. Now listen. Notice it says... So then after the Lord had spoken unto them, he was received up into heaven and did what? Sit where? Right At the right hand. Here, when, when the Stephen was being stoned, what did he see? It says, but he being full of the Holy Ghost looked up steadfast into heaven and saw the glory of God and Jesus where? On the right hand of God. Here's another text, Romans 8, 34. Who is he that condemneth? It is Christ that died, yea, rather, he, that he is risen again, who is even at the where? 
at the right hand of God, who also maketh intercession for us. Ephesians 1, verse 20 and 22, which he wrought in Christ when he raised him from the dead and set him on, on, at his right hand in the heavenly places. Far above all principalities and power and might and dominion and every name that is named, not only in this world, but also in that world which is to come. And I put all things under his feet. We go to 1 Peter. Jesus Christ who has gone into heaven and is on the right hand. So where is Jesus? Where did he go when he ascended up into heaven? He ascended to be where? At the right hand of the majesty in heaven. And think about it, folks. He said that through him we have access to who? To the Father. The reason why you have access to the Father is because you're connected to someone who is connected to the Father. We say amen to that. And so, Jesus then is a focus of Acts chapter 2. The whole purpose of Acts chapter 2 is to let you know that the one that you put your trust in has all power. How much? All, all power. In heaven and in earth. All right? The gift of tongues sent from heaven through the Holy Spirit was to what? was to confirm that Jesus was placed on the right hand of the throne. Many times God uses an earthly illustration to help us to understand heavenly themes and uh, ideas. For example, we have a sanctuary. The purpose of the actual sanctuary is because you and I cannot look directly into heaven. So God has given us a sandbox illustration down here on the earth to help us understand what is taking place in the heavens. When Jesus was speaking to Nicodemus, he was speaking about being born again and the working of the Holy Spirit. Nicodemus could not understand. So what did Jesus then do? Since Nicodemus didn't get the spiritual significance of what he was talking about, he shifted to nature and he said, the wind bloweth where it wants to, and you can hear the sound thereof, but you cannot know where it's coming and where it's going. So also is the working of the Holy Spirit. So God uses earthly things to help us to understand heavenly things. So here he gives an, an earthly demonstration of the giving of tongues so that people can realize that something is happening where? In heaven. Listen. When Christ passed within the heavenly gates, he was enthroned amidst the adoration of the angels. As soon as this ceremony was completed, as soon as what? The ceremony was completed. The Holy Ghost descended upon the disciples in rich currents, and Christ was indeed glorified, even with the glory which he had with the Father from all eternity. The Pentecostal outpouring was heaven's communication at the Redeemer's inauguration was what? Accomplished. According to his promise, he had sent the Holy Ghost from heaven to his followers as a token that he had as priest and king received all authority in heaven and on earth and was anointed one over his people. Amen. What do you say? So we have a Savior who is where? He's at the right hand, which means then that you have access directly where? Right to the throne, right to the Father. That's good news. Do you agree with me? Yes. Why don't you get more excited then? <laughs> yeah, you should say hallelujah. Praise God. We got somebody. We are connected. What do you say? Amen. We are connected. Listen, folks. Listen. The earthly event confirmed the heavenly reality, okay? Now, Jesus is compared, or Joseph was a type of Jesus. When Joseph was here on earth, Joseph was betrayed by his brethren. Is that true? Yes. Jesus was also betrayed. Joseph was slave, sold as a slave. Jesus was also sold as a slave. He was placed in prison. Jesus was placed in the prison tomb. He was delivered from prison. Jesus was delivered from the tomb. From the tomb and the prison, both were placed where? Right. On the right hand. Joseph was placed on the right hand of Pharaoh. Jesus was placed on the right hand of the Father. Okay? And the result was that Joseph sent gifts as proof that he was in authority. 
Jesus also sent gifts that he was proving the fact that he was now also in authority. Listen, you remember when Joseph made ruler of Egypt, right? The second ruler? You remember that his brother showed up and his brother did not recognize Joseph. And Joseph then began to test him. What did Joseph do? He began to test him to see if they had a change of heart. What was done to the disciples for those 10 days? They also were tested to see if their hearts would change. Then, when finally Joseph was convinced that they, were, that they had a change of heart, Joseph revealed himself to the disciples, or to his brethren. And immediately they cowered back thinking, oh, oh no, he's going to get even with us. And that's what happened with the Jews in the day of Pentecost. When they realized that, it was, that Christ was the, the Savior of the world, oh no, he's going to get even with us. But the contrary happened. Joseph showed him himself kind to his brethren. And then he said to them, haste ye and go to my father. What happened to me was prophecy fulfilled. Because Joseph had, had visions, is that true? And Joseph did not know how those visions were going to be realized until he was sent to where? To Egypt. And he told his brethren, this wasn't your doing, this was God's doing. This was a fulfillment of those visions that I had when I was telling you that I had those dreams. You didn't believe it, but here's the reality, boys. I am now, and you're bowing down to me. But look, I don't have anything against you. You're my brethren. I love you. But do me a favor. Go back home and do what? Tell who? Tell my father and say unto him, Thus saith thy son Joseph, God hath made me Lord of all Egypt. Come down unto me, tarry not. Jesus said to the disciples, When you receive power from the Holy Ghost, go and tell the world that I'm enthroned. Listen. You shall tell my father of all my glory in Egypt and all of all that you have seen and you have you shall haste and bring down my father hither. So the boys rushed back home. They got home to tell Papa that they had good news for him. So when they got home, what did they say? Joseph is yet what? He's alive, Dad. And what did J Jacob say? Boys, don't do that to me. You know how much I suffered at the loss of my son. Don't play games like that. But Dad, we're not playing games. He is alive, Dad. He what? He said he believed them what? Not. So what made Jacob believe? Listen to what made Jacob believe. When he saw what? The wagons which Joseph had sent to carry him, the spirit of Jacob, their father, revived. And Israel said, it is enough. My son is yet alive. In other words, Jacob didn't say, whoopee, I got ten new carts. The wagons, the camels, were proof. They were what? They were proof of the unseen had Jacob seen his, his son? Had he touched his son? No. So how did he know that Joseph was alive? It was by virtue of the gifts. By virtue of what? The gifts. The gifts convinced him that indeed Joseph was not only alive but enthroned. What do you say? So when the Holy Ghost came down, it was to convince them that Jesus was indeed alive. And that's why the Jews in those days accepted the Messiah, Jesus, as their Christ and God and Lord because now they were convinced by the gifts. That was the purpose of the gifts, to convince them that Jesus was enthroned. Only two amen. <laughs> that Jesus was what? No, I think you folks are so dazed with this that you say, wow. I know you're in awe. That's the way you should be. 
But listen, brethren, listen, listen. Because we have been shifted, do you hear what I'm saying? Because our, our vision has been shifted from the giver to the gift. When you hear about Acts chapter 2, your mind is always focusing on the gift rather than the gift giver. So the charismatic movement, did you hear what I'm saying? The charismatic movement, the speaking in tongues, was a diabolic approach to removing the glory that belongs to Christ to put it on tongues. So the shift of the world had been to put their focus on the gift rather than on the giver. And just like Otto Witt, who stole the glory from the prince, so the enemy has attempted to steal the glory of our Lord who has been exalted and placed it on some mere gift. Did you hear what I said? What kind of gift? A mere gift. Because you and I know that the Bible says that tongues will cease. Is that true? Is that true? Tongues will cease. And unfortunately, what people call tongues today is not really tongues anyway. It's not the actual gift that the Lord reveals here. What the Lord reveals is a gift of languages, not some gibberish that people spout out or being taught to roll their tongues in order to have the gift of, of uh, the Holy Ghost. I've met many, many wonderful Pentecostal folk who, as I've been able to teach them the truth, have left that particular way of serving the Lord and have turned to the truth, to the real Christ, to the exalted Christ, to the one who's enthroned. Listen. Joseph sent gifts to convince Jacob that he was alive and placed on the right hand of the throne of Egypt. So what is it? The gift or? Or the giver. One day I was at the airport. Took my wife to the airport. My wife um, has a violin that was made in 1743 by a student of Stradivarius. She's had it since she was nine years old. When I took her to the airport, we were in Guam. I watched to make sure that uh, she put the violin through the security thing, you know, the scanner and all that. But I could not see if she picked up her stuff. All I could see was just her back walking away, and there were a lot of people there. So I decided to leave and get, on, get in my car, and I began to drive, and I felt uncomfortable about driving away from the airport. So I decided to just park a little bit uh, from the airport and uh, wish that somehow I could communicate with her to see if she picked up a violin. But the problem was that she had a phone from the States, and when you turn it on in Guam, it costs you $2.90 a minute. So she wouldn't turn it on because of that while she was in Guam. But I, I thought, how can I communicate with her since her phone is off? So here's what I did. I simply bowed my head and I said, Lord God, could you please send a, a, a ray of light or a beam down to my wife and have her call me? That's all I said. My phone rang. It was my wife. And when my, when my wife called me, she said, do you have my violin? I said, no, honey. You took the violin with you. I don't have it. I'm on the plane. I said, well, get off the plane quickly. She said, I don't know if I can get off. I said, well, tell them that your violin's not with you. So I immediately went back to the airport. And I, fortunately, I'm a chaplain or have been a chaplain with the police department. And the guards already knew me. So I said, chaplain, what's the matter? I said, my wife, her violin is someplace in the mix over here, and it needs to be found. Okay, chaplain, we'll go right to it. Well, they ran and scampered and found the violin, ran to the, that stopped the airplane from closing the door. They ran to the, uh, to the, air, air, to the airplane, and uh, my wife was waiting at the door. They handed my wife the violin. They came back and said, okay, chaplain, she has it. And you know, when I got back in my car, I, I bowed my head in thanksgiving that my father, who is in heaven, is not too busy to hear my humble plea. Amen. 
Do you understand? I am connected. I'm what? Connected. I'm connected. I was in another situation. I was in Poland, Pastor Przewalski's home uh, country. And I had to speak way down there in Sakopani, which is south, about eight hours south from uh, Warsaw. And in purpose, I booked a flight out of uh, Czech Republic, which was two hours close to where I was, so I can fly from there to Prague, from Prague to Frankfurt, Frankfurt back to New York City, where I was working as a secretary of the conference. And I had a special meeting with the pastors. So I finished my task in, in Sakopani, drove to the airport, my airplane was supposed to leave at 6 in the morning. I got to the airport about 4 o'clock in the morning, 5 o'clock, still closed. Six, 10 minutes to 6 is still closed. My plane was supposed to leave at 6, right? So the lights went on at 10 to 6. I ran inside with my translator and uh, went to the lady. I said, I'm here. She said, for what? I said, for my plane to Prague. It's canceled. I said, it can't be canceled. She said, it's canceled, <laughs> mister. I said, but I have, a, I, I have a connection flight in Prague, and I have to catch that to, to Frankfurt. I'm sorry. It's canceled. She had no mercy. And I thought, what am I going to do now? Now I'm 10 hours away from uh, Warsaw, you understand. So we go down and sat down, and, and I prayed. I prayed to who? To my Lord. I said, Lord, you know I need to get to New York City for that meeting with the pastors. Somehow work something out for me. And so I went, I, I was, when I finished praying, an airplane landed. And I got excited. So I went to the counter and I said, Madam, I said, I heard an airplane land. She said, and so? I said, can I get on there? Where's it going? She said, it's going to Prague. Well, you can't get on it. I said, why not? It's an executive airplane. She said, you can't get on an executive airplane. I said, why not? She said, because it's an executive airplane. That's why. So I said, I'm going to pray that I get one seat on the airport, on that airplane. And I turned around. She looked at me like I was mad. So I went and sat down. And while I was sitting down, two Czech men walked in. And when they walked in, uh, they went to the counter, and King Longface, you know, there were scientists had a special meeting in Arizona, scientific meeting, and they had to get there. And they said, we don't know what we're going to do. Our flight is canceled. I said, I've been praying that I get a seat on an airplane that just landed. But they said it's an executive plane. But anyway, I, I'm going to go and ask the lady if I can get two more seats. So I went to the lady. I said, uh, uh, madam, I said, these guys need to get on the same plane, so I'm, I'm asking for two more seats. She said, mister, are you crazy? <laughs> she said, it's an executive plane, you understand? You can't get on it. So I said, I'm praying for three seats. And I turned around and walked away. And they said, what's going on? I said, well, uh, I, I told the lady that I'm praying for three seats. And they looked at me kind of funny, two scientists, right? So um, we're sitting there, and all of a sudden the lady calls my name. So I went, and she, she was white as a ghost. And she, and she said, mister... Uh, they are allowing you a seat to get on the plane. I said, praise the Lord. I said, but only one? She said, aren't you happy you at least got one? I said, of course I'm happy, but I need three seats, not one. She said, mister. So I walked back, and the gentleman said, what's going on? I said, they gave me one seat, but I'm praying for two more. <laughs> so then she called them. And handed them something. They came back. I said, what's going on? I said, they gave us two seats. I said, praise the Lord. So then we waited, and she called. Okay, time to board. So they got ahead of me, and the guy, uh, the fellow right before me turned around and said, you must be connected to the one upstairs. Yeah. And I said, I am. I am. The greatest news that the disciples could receive after all that they went through was to know that their Lord was enthroned. They were going to have to face some challenges that were coming up, and they needed to have confidence that the one that was enthroned would give them all that they needed to bear with whatever they would face.
And folk, look, you and I are heading for serious trouble, whether you understand it or not. Did you hear what I said? We are headed for what? Serious trouble. There are things that happen in the world that the scientists don't understand. If you come to my meeting on Sunday night, you'll understand. I'm going to present why the scientists are nervous. They're trying to get people off the planet. They think that the only solution is to fly off the planet and go someplace else. The scientists recognize that there's no hope for this earth. Did you hear what I'm saying? And you're planning for a future, to, you know, to become an engineer and all that. Continue to do that. But remember that you may not graduate. If everything that's happening continues to happen, folk, we are heading for serious trouble. And the reason why it's important for you and I to know that we have somebody who's enthroned is because we will need him in those times of trouble. So you need to get acquainted with him when? Now. Now is the time to get to know your Lord and Savior. He is enthroned. He has all the power vested in him. He can deliver you. I have been in many situations, friends, that, that only divine aid could help me out of. I've been in terrible circumstances that only God could be the one to deliver me. And I've been delivered every time. And if there was ever a time when we need to know the Savior, it is when? Now. It is now. Is Jesus your Lord and Savior? Have you accepted him as your Lord and Savior? Or are you just learning about him now? Have you become acquainted with him? Spend time in the word. Read the word. Study the word. Pray through the word. Seek God while he may be found. Seek him when he may be found. Now. How many of you are thankful that you have a Lord that's sitting at the right hand? Any of you? Would you raise your hand not half mass? You know, in America, when somebody dies, the flight goes only halfway. We need to raise our hand how? High. Lord, I rejoice that you are enthroned. And I place my life in your hands so you can be my Savior. Let's pray together. Heavenly Father, how grateful we are to know that indeed Jesus did rise. Indeed, he did ascend. And he is now mediating for us who is able. His blood is sufficient for all of our sins. And his power is sufficient for all of our troubles. Oh, God, forgive us when we have not trusted him as we should. And help us to trust him more, we pray. And if there's somebody here who has not yet accepted you, May today be the day, may now be the moment where they can say, yes, Lord, come into my heart. We thank you for hearing us. In Jesus' name, amen. Life can be so good life can be so hard never knowing what each day to bring to where you are sometimes I forget and sometimes I can't see that whatever comes my way you be with me my life is in your hands my heart is in your keeping i'm never without hope not when my future is with you my life is in your hands and though i may my voice and sing cause your love does amazing things Lord I know my life is in your hands nothing 